Welcome to the Clipboard Home Energy Checklist created by the Heartland Renewable Energy Society. My name is Craig Wolf. The following is from a live webinar workshop with the Sunflower Community Action, an organization from Wichita, Kansas. What we will be doing in these next few videos is looking for the causes of the energy losses that we experience in our homes and then we will look at how the checklist is organized and see examples of where these energy losses actually occur. Let's get started. So uh, let's go through a little bit of Energy 101 in terms of what is energy and how does uh, the loss how does the loss of energy happen in a home and so we have to understand a little bit more about the principles. So the first thing we're going to be talking about is, are what are the types of energy heat loss and the first type uh, of heat loss that we want to talk about is air infiltration and air, air infiltration is enemy number one and if you've ever felt a draft in your home that is air infiltration it's the air that seeps into the cracks of your home uh, and those are the things that uh, when a professional goes after and try to make a home energy efficient that's the area that is really a key focus of of the uh, of the of the professional and, uh, and should be of the homeowner as well uh, another type of heat loss are conduction heat losses and what we mean by conduction is that's the heat that actually travels through a material itself and that happens by molecules vibrating faster and faster as it, it as one warm molecule touches the next molecule it starts vibrating faster and that's how heat travels through conduction is by uh, through a surface is by um, uh, molecules getting excited and, and moving faster and faster so insulation then is one of those materials because of all the pockets of air in it that keep those molecules from being next to one another and vibrating and so that's why insulation is a good insulator because it helps stop those conduction losses uh, a piece of metal for instance is a very uh, poor insulator because all those molecules are very very dense and so when you travel when one side gets cold or one side gets hot that heat is what travels through. Uh, in fact, heat is the only thing that moves in terms of conduction. In other words, the warm side will vibrate and it'll, it'll actually lose its heat going out to the other side. Another type of heat loss uh, are convection losses. And this is if you had, let's say, a wall cavity that didn't have any insulation in it you would get this kind of big loop that goes inside that wall cavity where on the cold side the air would fall down and it'd go reach to the bottom and on the warm side of that cavity the air would rise and so you'd get this very slow convection loop that would help pull heat away from um, wherever it is whatever whatever surface is there and then transfer that heat to the cold side another type of um, energy loss or heat loss has to do with condensation and you'll see beads of condensation that form on a warm surface and as, as the, if there's enough moisture in the air there you'll see beads that that form on that surface as the as the moisture that's in the air when it touches that colder surface can no longer hold that moisture and so it forms condensating little bubbles on on that cold surface and so that's that's another way that we can lose our heat. And then radiation is uh, another way that we uh, uh, that heat travels. And um, so radiation then is energy that passes through space like sunlight. And what when we get the sun's energy that comes into a home, what we want to try and do is keep that energy from going back out. If you've ever been next to a fireplace or a wood-burning stove and you say, man, that feels really good, that's because that's radiant heat that your body is feeling. In fact, that's one of the reasons why a solar home, a passive solar home works well, is that 
you, you heat up the mass in the home in a passive solar home and then that heat from that mass radiates and hits your body and you're able to feel more comfortable at lower air temperatures with that radiant heat. Uh, I'm going to bounce back to what I, I remember what I was going to say on conduction losses. And if, if, there's, if, there, if there, you're sitting in a metal chair right now uh, and that metal chair has wood on it or and metal and you take your hand and touch that metal, it feels cold, it feels cool, but then you move your hand and touch a piece of wood and it doesn't feel nearly as cold. Well, those two surfaces are exactly the same temperature. What the difference is, and that's one of the examples of conduction heat losses, is that metal is a much greater conductor of heat. And so when your hand touches that piece of metal, it pulls the heat out of your hand and you feel like, well, that's really, that's cold. But then when you touch wood, wood is not a very good conductor of heat and you don't feel uh, like it's a cold surface, but they're actually the same temperature. So I'm glad I remembered that because that's an interesting way of looking at it. And by the way, I should say if anybody has a question on anything as I'm going through this, um, yell at me or yell at Jeffrey and we will um, answer the question as we go. So now we're looking at uh, the four pages of the clipboard home energy checklist. And as you note that as we look through these pages that they are divided into sections. And so that's how we figure a homeowner would go through this by area of the house or by information. And so that's how we will go through this today. And so, um, uh, but how do, do and, and we may want to talk a little bit about this and get some feedback from you folks, but how will the Sunflower Community Action Organization use the checklist? Well, first of all, uh, and, and do you all have a copy of it in, in, in front of you at this time, Jeffrey? Okay. So you'll always want to leave a copy, of course, with the homeowner uh, that, that you're talking to. And it is my understanding that SCA will not conduct the analysis for the homeowner, but will provide them information so that they can conduct their own checklist uh, of their home's energy features. But what you may want to do is to sit down with the homeowner and pick an example from each area or an area or two or three or four and, and go over it with them so that they kind of have a handle of how to use the um, ho clipboard home energy checklist. And as you're, as you're explaining it, feel free to walk over and show them something that they can do, like uh, with the draft detector tool, which we will look at here in a minute, and show them how to use that. Did, did I hear you start to say, say something, Jeffrey? We had a question regarding what would be good examples to show the homeowner as we're giving them our introduction to the clipboard audit. Oh, any, anything you want to. I mean, anything you feel comfortable with that you think that the homeowner is going to grasp. So that's just totally up to you. Uh, and as we go through uh, the checklist today, we'll be seeing examples of, of where each of these things are. And uh, certainly the homeowner is going to have questions. And I want to let you know that if there's a question that you can't answer, say, you know, that's a great question and I will get back to you on that. Uh, and then you, you guys feel free to contact me either by email or by phone, and, and then we'll, we'll get back to you with what that answer is, and then you can make a connection back with the homeowner. So what are the areas of investigation? How is the clipboard uh, home energy checklist organized? Well, these are the sections. We look at attics and crawl spaces, and then we'll look at wall insulation. And then because of how it's organized, we will also look at basements and crawl spaces. We look at air infiltration. We look at HVAC, which stands for home ventilation and air conditioning and fireplaces. Look at windows, look at water systems, look at lifestyle changes, and then look at landscaping uh, and checking the exterior of the house. So how the homeowner would use this then is they would see the, the page of the uh, checklist and they would literally go through and it, as soon as they go through an area they would check it and in the right hand column they would 
look and, and they would make their notations of what they found so that after they do their uh, go through their energy checklist that they're able to remember what they saw and uh, so they could go back and, and kind of make their own game plan as to how they want to try to begin to address their home energy issues. So we're going to start with attics and crawl spaces. Uh, and so one of the first things they want to do, and, and so you can kind of follow along with the, the home energy checklist that's in your hand right now. But what they want to do is to look at their attic insulation. Is it uniform? And is there, are there areas that where there's too much or too little insulation? Uh, and the, and in, in, in generally speaking, if you only have six to eight, you don't have enough. You want to try and have about 14 or 16 insul in inches of insulation uh, in your attic. And you can see in this picture there that what they've, they've got uh, probably some existing insulation that was in there. And now they're adding other types of insulation over top of it. So in this case, they're adding fiberglass insulation. But in general, um, the experts feel that cellulose information is probably, for multiple reasons, um, the, the better of the types of insulation. And before you insulate, one of the things that uh, the professionals do is they sometimes in, in older homes, they will take out all of the insulation because, and I'm, I want you to watch where my mouse is going here. You see this little area here? This is in an attic with no insulation. Uh, and see this area right here? That's a hole that goes down into the, the conditioned area where it's trying to be cooled or heated in the summer and winter time. And so this is one of those areas that is a, is a culprit that you can find in your attic um, that you want to look for uh, in the attic space. Now here's an attic fan that's up there. And what you probably want to do, and we'll see an example of it later on, but you probably want to take some styrofoam or some, some lumber or something and make a dam around the perimeter of this attic fan so that um, they, when they put in their insulation that it doesn't fall down into the attic fan, it can go right up against the side of it. And then this is showing uh, an area where there's a kind of a, a channel or a chase that goes down into the house. And this is, this is a huge place where uh, cold air can, can come into the house. So these are the types of things you discover when you get into your attic and look around. And you need to be very careful because you, you, you gotta walk on the ceiling joist because if you don't, you're gonna put your foot right through the ceiling down below. Here's another, here's where a, a plumbing pipe is going to go through. And back when they built these houses, you know, energy wasn't, wasn't as, as much of a topic as it is today. And so they just cut a hole and ran a pipe down there. This is a, like a four inch vent stack pipe probably that, that goes down. And here is, here is a great place for coal to just dive into the home. Um, we're, we're in an, an attic now again still and we are looking at the uh, a, a ceiling fixture and so we're, we're, when you have the opportunity you this is a little this is a, a foam uh, foam gun but uh, you can use cans of foam which would work just fine now this is a professional so he's got more fancy equipment that that is that uh, he uses to uh, inject foam where he needs it but certainly uh, cans of foam, great stuff that you can get at the hardware store works just as well. Now, um, there's also places in the, in the attic where there may not be any insulation. Like we're in the attic now and on the other side of this wall is living space and there's absolutely no insulation there. So this is something on the checklist that as you're going through, that you can say, well, let's see, here, here's, a, here's a vertical wall in the attic space, and I know my bedroom's right on the other side, and there's absolutely no insulation. No wonder that room is cold or hot. Now, another thing to be watching for when you're in the attic is attic ventilation. Uh, on the, and, and you have soffit vents, which are down low in the attic, that you can see when you're on the ground looking up from the outside. And then you have upper vents so that in the summertime, your attic is, is that all the hot air that's in the attic can have a way to move out. 
But what we see here is that over time, or maybe with a bad installer, um, the insulation is covering up the soffit vent that's at the bottom of this insulation here. Another thing to look for are ducts in unconditioned, unconditioned spaces. And whether it's a return duct or a supply duct, this is a place where hot air in the summertime or cold air in the wintertime gets right into your ventilation system, your HVAC system, and causes uh, real energy problems. Another thing to look for is the duct work in your attic space where it's been trampled on over time. Somebody got up there, a contractor or a homeowner, and stepped on it. So, you know, the room that's being supplied by this uh, flex duct is not getting their fair share of energy right now. Um, and so what, what you can use is, is silver um, tape to get in there and, and, and shore up some of these areas. Uh, either either you can do it or a professional can do it, but there's there's specific types of tape and it's typically silver tape. You know, they used to call gray tape duct tape. Well, this stuff is better than that, this silver tape. And so whenever you can, you want to try and use that. Now, another thing to look for when you're roaming around in your attic space are recessed can lights. Um, recessed can lights are required by code not to have insulation around them because especially when they used the old style bulbs, the incandescent bulbs would get very hot to the touch. That's because it's creating heat, costs more energy, fluorescent uh, bulbs, CFLs, compact fluorescent um, uh, light bulbs don't get nearly as hot. And, and certainly in general, you wanna take every light bulb in your house and that's not a fluorescent and throw it away and start using compact fluorescent light bulbs. Uh, but here is an example of all these little holes here are places where the heat just goes right up into the attic and out. Now there's, there's things you can do for that uh, that we'll see here in a second, but here's another um, compact or a, 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 a recessed light fixture that's, that they haven't done a good job of keeping insulation away from it and that could present a fire hazard right there one one of the yeah the question was when should we use incandescent bulbs versus uh, fluorescent bulbs you should always use a cfl in the in the uh, any time of year because that is a very expensive type of heat that is a form of heat in the winter time but it's a very expensive form of heat it's like turning on your stove your electric stove and letting that heat the room you're you're much better off to let your furnace do the heating and cooling yeah and then another place where uh, you can lose lots of heat is in uh, your attic access doors and hatches you can see here that uh, this is a drop down um, ladder that comes out of the ceiling and they've got it set up so that when it's in its up position that this little piece of weather stripping right here is pressing up against this there's a there's a cap on it here that has weather stripping here and here so that what you've created is is an airtight more of an airtight system it takes kind of a handyman to be able to do some of this stuff but uh, that's just another area where people need to be watching and see when they're doing their checklist, where where are all the culprits in my house that are costing me energy? Here is here is a, an attic access, and you can see there's the spring right over here where it's lowered down. And what they've done here is use just a couple inches of a rigid blue styrofoam insulation, and they've caulked it with the, uh, that foam caulk. Uh, that you know those cans of foam like great stuff so that when they add insulation that they can get a higher level of insulation uh, without it falling down into the stairway every time they open up to get into the attic to check something out now we're going to talk about wall insulation wall insulation is hard to fix you have to try and find out first of all what is your insulation there are some houses that don't have any in the older 
older houses that don't have any insulation in them and you want to try and figure out where am I losing my heat what what are in my walls so if you can find a spot where you can remove some sheetrock and and do kind of an exploratory surgery that's one of the things you can do and the best type of insulation to put in these walls that don't have insulation is cellulose information a professional can come in and he can uh, uh, blow it either from the inside or from the outside and that, that does a great job of adding insulation into your house it's a it's a kind of it's not the first thing you would do but it's certainly one of the important things that you would do if you're trying to save energy and, and depending upon what you discover is the insulation uh, in your wall system that is going to determine how how much of a problem that really is So now let's go take a look at basements and crawl spaces And here we're looking at a foundation wall and the and the first floor that's above it And you can see what they've done here again with that great stuff foam it looks like what they've done here is taken some blue board styrofoam and cut it fairly close to the uh, opening dimensions, stuck it in there, uh, and they don't have to do it a very perfect job because this foam is going to fill in any gaps that you would have. So uh, this is a great way to reduce both air infiltration, which is the movement of air through cracks, and to stop those conduction losses, which is the movement of air through a material with this uh, rigid insulation. So rim joists are um, an area where you can make a big difference uh, in, in your air infiltration losses, most importantly, and also your conduction losses. Then your basement walls, it's fairly straightforward. You can build uh, a two by four wall system, uh, insulate it with fiberglass or cellulose, and then later on, if you, if you can, you can finish off the basement area and, and have a warmer basement. If you're in your basement and you're looking at where uh, utilities come in and you can actually see light through those holes, you really want to get in there and use some great stuff. And this is, this is the, uh, one of the cans that, that is available for homeowners at Home Depot or Lowe's or anywhere like that. Uh, any hardware store will have this stuff and you can see he's used it where this electrical conduit is penetrating as well as uh, where the uh, sill plate which is what this piece of wood is called sits on the foundation here and they've foamed the edge of that so that to stop air infiltration losses another thing to look at are cracks in the foundation a lot of times these cracks will go all the way through sometimes they need to get a professional to take a look at it but if that crack goes all the way through, that's a ready-made uh, place for air infiltration to come through, let alone water or other things. So those, those certainly need to be addressed. Uh, cellar doors um, are an area that uh, typically go into a crawl space or a very, or a larger crawl space is what this kind of is. It's kind of a glorified cellar basement uh, but this door here, uh, I guarantee you, is very poorly um, constructed to protect against getting the area below the house down here cold. You can see there's a gap uh, underneath the door here. So um, cellar doors to either crawl spaces or uh, cellars are another area on the checklist. Uh, and in crawl spaces, um, you want to make sure that uh, you've got insulation in those areas because that down there is an unconditioned area. Uh, and uh, one caution is that if you've got plumbing pipes running through here and that they have never frozen over time, and let's say this is not insulated, but you've never had any problem with freezing pipes or anything like that, now you're going to insulate and if you've got a pipe running through here what you've done by insulating is you've taken that pipe that was relying on the heat coming from up above to keep it from freezing and now you've reduced that water pipe that's run down through here 
to be able to be warm anymore. And so it's going to freeze and um, you're going to have a broken pipe. So whenever you can, you may need to take some of that, some of those copper pipes and move them up into the cavity and then put the insulation over top of it. So just be aware that you can cause a problem by doing something good. You can cause a problem with your pipes if you insulate and don't protect the pipes that are in there. So we're going to be talking about air infiltration, and air infiltration is enemy number one. Uh, where do uh, where does air infiltration occur? Looks like the big culprits are floors, walls, and ceilings. Uh, the next biggest culprit are are ducts in your in your house that that probably in the attic space where they've been damaged over time or just poorly installed. Your fireplace. Plumbing penetrations, we saw some of those. Your doors and windows, your fans and vents, and also electrical outlets. Now, here's that draft detector tool. And this is real simple. In fact, it, it, I think it would be a good thing when you visit a house that you make one of these up and you just leave it with the homeowner. Because all it is is a pencil with a, a piece of saran wrap, you know, that sticky stuff that... that it, is real flimsy and it blows real easy so you can walk around the house where you suspect you have air leaks like at an electrical outlet and you can use this tool because it'll easily that flap will easily blow and you'll be able to see what's going on now another thing you can use are smoke pencils but this is this is a something that anybody could make on their own and be able to see the movement of air so here's all the places where air infiltration can occur. And we were just a minute ago up in the attic and we saw ductwork that was messed up. We saw uh, light fixtures here where um, uh, air was coming through. Uh, so there's uh, all kinds of places in the, in the attic that we've already reviewed. Uh, and then through this, the, the plates of the house where the floors meet between the first floor and second floor and between the first floor and the basement. Those are all areas. Um, and so you can study this picture and windows and doors. Those are all areas where air infiltration can occur. Uh, this is a kind of an out of fo focus picture of a guy caulking a window, but windows and doors, make sure the frames of windows and doors are well caulked and use a good silicone or silicone acrylic 30 or 40 or 50 year caulk is what you want to use. And then here's a little, yeah, go ahead. We had a question about size of uh, the bead of caulk that should be used. That's probably going to vary. If you've got a bigger gap, you'll need to, to run one. But, you know, what you want to do is to run maybe, a, a, I would say, without seeing a location, a quarter inch to a quarter inch bead or so. And then you take your finger and wipe it, wipe it down so that it kind of creates a smooth surface. Uh, so that's kind of the technique and you know the first time you do it you'll you'll make a big mess and the next you know a half hour later you're you're practically an expert but you just gotta gotta be careful and I always when I'm doing it I have a roll of, of paper towels when I'm caulking um, and uh, and I'm constantly wiping my fingers off and throwing the paper towels away and then I lick my finger because a wet finger kind of makes a smoother line so you just kind of have to experiment till you get good at it now here's an electrical outlet with a foam gasket, and so this is a this is a real simple, and you can get these at the hardware stores. And so what happens is is that there's electrical wires and stuff that are coming into the electrical box that's behind this sheetrock here. And so I'm sure if you haven't try it this winter, but but feel electrical outlets and see the air that's coming through. And so what this foam gasket does is it helps minimize that air that comes around and uh, into the home through electrical outlets. So when you put your cover plate on, it compresses around the edge and makes a, a good tight seal there. So this is, this is a, a great little idea. This is another out of focus picture, but you can see what's going on. 
you know, you got a brick wall here. You've got a place where a couple of big pipes are going into the house, and it's obvious that this thing needs to be fixed. And so, again, that great stuff foam is, is the way to do it. Air conditioners. In, on a cold, windy day, you can feel air coming through that air conditioner. So get on the outside of your house and put a cover over it of some sort. Uh, they're, they're available at hardware stores, and you can work on the inside and the outside to help reduce that air infiltration, enemy number one. Uh, around fireplaces, um, this is, is, doesn't have a very good shot. I, if I had had time today, I'd take a picture of my fireplace. But all along, around the perimeter here, I went around and caulked my fireplace. A lot of times the masonry on a fireplace is on the outside of the home. Um, and um, you, so you can caulk it on the outside because I guarantee you that's going to be a place if it isn't caulked where you're going to lose heat. Now, on my fireplace, because I knew back in 1978 when I built my home that uh, a fireplace is made of stone. And because it's made of stone, can anybody tell me what type of heat losses would be caused by that stone? It would be, you would, you would be, be having conduction losses through that stone because stone is a lousy insulator. So when that stone, if it's on the outside, when it gets cold, it's going to pull the heat from the inside right out. So that, that's conduction losses or the heat traveling through a material itself. Uh, I should bounce back here and also say that um, it, the fireplace chase itself, glass doors are a way to help some of those heat losses that go, literally go up the chimney. You can also put a balloon uh, in the chimney in the winter time. Uh, some of them are actually you can take in and out, uh, but, but fireplaces aren't really a great source of heat. Uh, they're great aesthetically, but they're not a great source of heat, so um, you lose heat up the chimney. Uh, attic fans and attic access hatches. This is uh, in, in a home that I built. Uh, we had an attic fan up there. I like to use attic fans, but boy, in the wintertime, uh, they're, they're, they, they lose lots of heat that come down through it. So what I did was uh, create a styrofoam cork, if you will. This was on a piano hinge, and I would drop it down into the down position. And then once a year, I would put this cork up there, uh, use weather stripping to make it airtight, and then I'd take it down in the summertime so I could use my attic fan uh, and cool my house down at night and then close my house up during the day. And it extended the period of time when I did not have to use air conditioning. Here's a shot of that of a ceiling fan where they've used styrofoam insulation around the perimeter. You can see this little white line here. That's, that's weather stripping so that when this lid comes down, uh, it has a, a place where it'll seal uh, and in the wintertime keep that cold air from coming down into the house itself. Okay, HVAC and fireplaces. The first bullet says floors and wall registers. You just want to make sure that you don't have a carpet that's over top of a floor register or a big piece of furniture that's in front of a wall register where you're being supplied or, or, or a, a return register. So just check those things out to make sure that the heat that you're buying from the utility is getting into the house. The other thing is a setback thermostat, uh, which is a great, great tool. And um, uh, as you can set that thermostat back at night, you can set it when you're gone during the day at work if no one's in the home. So it helps you manage how much heat your house needs. Um, and you can you know, set it a half hour before you come home so that by the time you get home, the house is back up. Um, ducts in unconditioned spaces. We've talked about some of this stuff, but this, this is a, a duct where they had a, a poor connection here to a main trunk line. And so what they did is they used that magical great stuff foam caulk to help 
make this connection airtight. Uh, service and uh, filters, changing your filters on a regular basis is an important thing to do and um, you should do it at, ideally at, at you know, change your filter at the beginning of the air conditioning season and at the beginning of the heating season. I know that I'm as bad as anybody else in terms of remembering to do that stuff but it does make a difference. Your system will run easier and that means you will feel more comfortable and pay less money to the man. Uh, and when it's time to get a new system, if your system is about ready to die on you, now's the time to, to get a higher energy efficient system. Ener uh, the cost of energy is not going to go down. It's going to go up over time. And it's, a, it's one of your best investments to get a, a high energy system. I built uh, my house in 1978 and my furnace lasted about 30 years. And I was paying in the wintertime on a bad month, you know, $240 for my heat. And I put in a, a new high energy efficient system. And my highest bill the last two winters has been 60 some bucks. So it will make a huge difference. Here's an interesting shot to do a roof check. And what you see here is... Um, there's one side of the house that's losing a lot more heat than the other side. So something is going on in that house that makes the snow not melt because it's not getting warmth from the house on one side of the house. But on the other side of the house, it's getting plenty of heat that's being lost from the conditioned area. Uh, and that heat is going right literally through the roof. So do a roof check. Uh, on window treatments, uh, these are uh, you, there's many types of window treatments out there. This is a product called Window Quilt. It runs in a track down the side of the window. It has a little gasket here and it rolls up behind this valance here. So, um, on a window system, if you're this is a big sliding glass door right here, and if you're sitting in this chair and it's 10 degrees outside. I will uh, describe it this way. I remember how I said you, you, that radiant heat from a wood-burning stove makes you feel comfortable. Uh, well, this is a cold, cold surface on a 10 degree day. And if you're sitting in that chair, what your body is doing is radiating heat. And that cold surface says, give me all the heat you can because I want it and your body will feel cold because your the radiant heat from your body is literally being sucked to that cold surface. So uh, having something between you and that cold surface is going to help your body feel more comfortable and your furnace work not as hard. In the winter protection, um, where a lot of homes don't have a good window system, or double glazing, you know, with the newer windows. You can put up once a year and take down once a year a product by 3M that is kind of like a shrink wrap cellophane, a saran wrap, if you will, that's made for windows. And so this will give you that extra glazing and help produce air infiltration that comes through old winters, windows in the wintertime. Now, it's also good to realize when you're planting trees and other things like that, that there are two completely different paths that the sun takes between winter and summer. In the winter time, the sun will rise low in the southeast and go fairly low in the sky and set in the southwest. In the summertime, it actually rises north of due east, goes very high in the sky, and then sets in the north of west, in the northwest side. So in the summertime then, what the, the windows that are particularly vulnerable are the eastern windows here where the sun is beginning to climb. And now we're in the heat of the day. The air conditioning is working hard. And if, I, if I've got a bank of windows on the west side of my house over here, this summer sun now 
is just kicking up that air conditioning and say, work, you son of a gun, work, because I'm just pouring my energy into the home. And this is also why a passive solar home works in the window in, in the wintertime, because you, you've, if in a well-designed home, you put the majority of glass on the south side so that this low winter sun goes right into the home. And uh, this is looking at south glass. If you've got a two foot overhang and a six foot uh, from the top of the soffit here to the windowsill, you can see that in the winter time, the sun is able to come underneath that overhang and into the house to help warm the house on this south window. But this overhang in the summertime uh, is, is large enough that that high winter sun up here is blocked and for the most part blocks most of, in this particular design, in this particular drawing, blocks most of that winter, or I'm sorry, most of that summer sun out. And remember, you, you've seen in the old old time where people would have awnings on their on their windows. That's exactly why they have awnings on their windows. It's generally on the south side or the west side of the house, and it helps keep the that hot summer sun out that heats up and makes your air conditioning work harder. Uh, new windows uh, generally, if, when you're talking to a window salesman, they'll say, "Yeah, they'll guarantee this and they'll guarantee that," but you're far better off to buy $100 worth of caulk and great stuff foam than buy new windows. Uh, they will, you will save much more energy by doing those types of things first. And that's another good reason why it's good to have an energy auditor come and tell you what the priority is uh, in your home. And I should also say that another benefit um, for an energy auditor that's professionally trained is that they're also trained about the safety of furnaces. Uh, in the first paragraph on the home energy checklist at the very top, it says that you it's hard, very hard to do, but if you've got an old furnace and you work really hard on making your house airtight, it's hard to do, but you can make your home so that it is dangerously unhealthy because it's not you're not getting enough fresh air into the home in the homes that i built i made them extremely airtight and we actually used a special device called an air to air heat exchanger which helped bring in cold air from the outside but it preheated it with the stale air that's being exhausted so we were able to bring in zero degree air and by the time it got into the room it was 50 degrees and we're exhausting the stale air and bringing in fresh air so just be advised that if you're going to do extensive work on your house and you've got an older furnace you want to have that furnace checked okay we're talking about water systems now and uh, here we are in a crawl space and you can see that that uh, something happened here and, and it's it's looks like it's leaking water uh, that's coming out of there and uh, if they would have insulated uh, these joists in here this water leak from this frozen pipe would have happened even sooner than it did there was a question about why that freezing would have happened even sooner and that is because if they would have insulated the floor joist where the room up above is a conditioned area that gets heat, they would have insulated that floor. Then the heat would not have been able to travel down into the crawl space. And that heat probably helped keep that pipe from freezing for some time until the temperature got so low that it couldn't. If they would have had that floor insulated, then it would have been colder down there sooner and the pipe would have been, been uh, frozen and broken sooner. So the lesson there is make sure your pipes are well protected by being up against the floor with the insulation on the outside or the cold side so that that pipe stays warm. For hot water systems, generally speaking, you want to set your thermostat to about 120 degrees. Uh, you have to kind of 
adjust it yourself and decide how warm I really need it. Uh, as, as cool as you can keep it and still have it warm enough, that's where you want it. You want it, <clears throat> I put it so it's a little bit too hot for me to have my hands just sitting underneath it, but uh, it's not going to scald me uh, that way that uh, my, and you're talking about your tank losses here from the surface of this tank. There are insulation kits that you can put on the outside, but you want to be careful with those insulation kits because if it's a gas hot water heater, you want to enable that gas to still be able to breathe, to still get air. So at the bottom down here where you light the pilot light, etc., um, you want to make sure that you've installed that correctly. And there are plenty of websites that show you how to do that. Another thing you can uh, change is your habits around your, your showers. You can get a low flow shower head uh, and you can even have a little button here where you can lather up and use the button, turn off the water. Uh, and um, uh, so you're not wasting hot water. And then when you're ready to rinse, you can flip that button and it'll, it'll run the hot water again. Okay, lifestyle and miscellaneous, you need to dress for success. If you're trying to save money uh, on your home and you're walking around in your bare feet or uh, with your socks on, with no slippers, you're not trying very hard uh, because you need to be keeping your feet warm if that's one of the areas of your, of your body that, that gets cold. Uh, another thing you need to do is wear three layers of clothing, t-shirt, shirt, and a sweater. And as I tell my wife, and a bra don't count. So if she says, boy, it's getting cool in here, and I look over at her and she's got one layer on, I say, well, you're not dressed for success. You need to have be wearing three layers of clothes. Moving air is good in the summertime with ceiling fans or other fans because that moving air helps uh, make your body feel cooler because any moisture or perspiration that's on your body, when that moving air goes across your body, that condensation, if you will, that's on your body will uh, help remove heat from your body and you will feel more comfortable. Moving air is bad in the wintertime because drafts make you feel cold. So that's one of the things that where why you want to stop air infiltration is because if you have a drafty house, guaranteed you will feel cold. Uh, for electronics, you want to plug your appliances ideally into power strips and then turn off the power strip. Uh, all of our little gadgets and doodads have little transformers. And even when they're not plugged in, if you put your hand on a little transformer for, the, for your phone charger, for your cell phone or something, it's warm. Well, that means if it's warm that it's costing you energy. It's, it's pulling energy. Uh, uh, electrical energy into that e e into that transformer even when it's not being used. Some studies have shown that up to 11% of your losses are caused by these what they call phantom losses. We had a question regarding light boxes in connection with light switches. No, if you've got a switch that'll turn off certain outlets and, and that would be a good thing to have all your stuff plugged into uh, and then when you're not and when you don't need it, you can just turn off your light switch. So that'll work just fine. We've talked about trees for landscaping already, um, but this is in the landscaping area. So I wanted to uh, reiterate that when you're planting trees, the absolute best place to plant a tree is on the west side of your house. The next best place is on the east side of your house um, to keep the summer sun out. And then on the north side of your house, because most of the, of the winter, at least in our area of the country, comes winter winds come from the north and northwest. So this area back here would be where you'd want to plant a, um, uh, an evergreen tree as opposed to a deciduous tree that loses its leaves. So back here is where you'd plant those evergreens. And here's, here's showing uh, an example of where shade trees are on the east side and west side and where they've used evergreens on the north side. So this drawing 
uh, extremely, uh, it lays out the planting of trees extremely well. Uh, and then with landscaping, it, whenever you can, try and find, and you can talk to your uh, nursery, and they'll know exactly what you're talking about, but try and use native plants that are used to our climate to help uh, help you have better success at gardening and also keeps you from using as much water. We had a question about uh, types of insulation, which ones are better and where you use which ones. Well, the styrofoam, uh, in terms of comparing styrofoam insulation to fiberglass or cellulose, those are the pretty three common types. Cellulose and fiberglass have a pretty close um, level of uh, R value, uh, and styrofoam has a higher level of R value, but it really depends upon the application as to where you use them. Sometimes it helps to have a rigid piece of insulation. Styrofoam is going to cost a little bit more. Cellulose is considered a better insulation than fiberglass. Fiberglass has, literally, it's, it's fiber glass. So some of that stuff uh, is considered uh, hazardous in some circumstances, some circumstances. And the cellulose just outperforms um, fiberglass overall in terms of helping reduce air infiltration as well as just conduction losses. One of the biggest opportunities we have as a nation is to take our existing houses and make them more energy efficient. Energy efficiency is the cheapest source of energy we've got.